Hello, hello. Hi, Andrea. Nice to see you. Although we are a little bit distances, but uh, yeah, I'm sure you prepared a wonderful talk. Uh, I'm not sure whether I have really to present you to the to the audience, but uh, Andrea is uh, one of the co core developers of uh, the GeoServer project and uh, everything around this. And I'm, yeah, quite sure that you're going to show a really interesting talk to us. So it's your stage. Thank you. So yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about adding quality assurance to open source projects, drawing from uh, my experience adding it to GeoTools, GeoWebCast, and GeoServer. First, a uh, quick sh uh, shout out to my company, GeoSolutions. We have offices in Italy and the United States, customers worldwide. We are a, a, a strongly technical uh, organization with 25 engineers out of 30 collaborators. We support a number of open source projects, including GeoServer, MapStore, GeoNode, and GeoNetwork, and provide support, uh, deployment support, the customized solutions, professional training, bug fixing, new features, and, and whatnot. We also believe strongly in open source. That's why we are here. Uh, we believe strongly in open standards, and uh, that's why we are an OGC member, and uh, we support the standards critical to GeoInt. Now, let's get into the presentation. Some definitions. What is quality assurance? Uh, Wikipedia says it's a way of pre preventing mistakes and defects in a ma manufactured product. What does it mean for software? Well, it means doing a good design, testing, having uniform code, reviewing uh, code changes, and, uh, and more, much more. Uh, why do we want to use automatic quality assurance? Why did, did I push on it? Because quality assurance is a lot of work and it's a lot of tedious work. So we need to automate as much as possible and spare humans uh, for the more complex task, uh, leaving all the minutiae to robots, uh, which can do thousands of simple checks in minutes and uh, also reduce the personal conflicts. Because when you go and start pointing at uh, formatting issues, uh, leftover variables, methods that do nothing to people, they start pointing the, the finger back at you and saying, oh, the QA guy is mean to me. If instead it's a robot doing that, uh, well, at the very least, uh, they are not pointing the finger at you. <laughs> now, um, how is it done in open source projects? Uh, with continuous integration, with testing on different platform, formatting checks, and static analysis checks. And I'm going to cover them one by one. Now, how do we, did we get here? How did, did we get to the point that uh, automated quality assurance was a need rather than a plus? GeoTools, GeoServer, and GeoWebCache are three large interconnected Java projects. Each one of them is split into, into many sub-modules. In the beginning, there were a few tens of modules on each product, uh, but they grew over time. Each module was maintained by one developer, at most a few developers. So um, each one was like a king of his own little castle, and there was little uh, overlap. The QA level that we <laughs> required back at the time, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it was, yeah, it has some tests, it compiles the test pass, yeah, good to go, let's go, release. Uh, over time, things changed. Um, uh, the, the business model on, on which these projects thrive is maintenance and feature development contracts, which means uh, that in terms of maintenance, uh, people providing maintenance have to provide services for any module, not just the, uh, the ones that they are very familiar with. So it broadens the scope a lot. Right, right now, today, I basically have to be aware of more or less all the modules in GeoTools and GeoServer, which is well over 200. Uh, and it's starting to stretch me uh, very, very thin. Um, also, features. Uh, we, uh, we sell development of features, so we get, we get more and more and more modules. However, the number of developers is more or less the same. Um, so there is more work for each developer and more code sharing. Uh, we assisted to, uh, over the years to an open uh, uh, operating system polarization. At first, we... 15 years ago, we had uh, several active daily developers spread on different operating systems. So we had a few on Linux, a few on Windows, a few on OS X. But over the years, uh, slowly but uh, steadily, 
all the active daily developers gravitated towards Linux, leaving almost no one on Windows and OS X. Um, uh, having projects that lived this, this long, uh, we are talking around 20 years, uh, uh, means that uh, there is a wear and tear in, in uh, the, the development group itself. Uh, the options are that you either make it your day job or you allocate a tolerable amount of spare time and don't go beyond it. Otherwise, you, well, you burn out. Um, however, we are losing bits and pieces along the way because uh, changes in job, changes in family life and so on, exhausting in general. I recommend you to read uh, when you have a, a minute, the few that hired the open source coders. What happens when a, a developer leaves is that the remaining developer have to maintain stuff they did not write or are familiar with, which uh, poses certain problems. Um, companies are being uh, uh, successful as, at uh, selling uh, services around uh, GeoTools and GeoServer, which means the business grew and uh, more developers were hired into working into the project. And this comes with different allegiances because the maintainers are typically tied to the projects. Uh, the, the, old, the old school developers that started the project. But new hires are tied to the company. So the focus is different. You go from the project is important of the maintainers to I need to finish this task to get to my next task, which is uh, the, the focus of the new hire. Also, they got lower experience in the project and its uh, ways. Also, GitHub. GitHub has been also uh, at the same time great and a disaster. <laughs> it's great because it's really easy to fork, change, and make a pull request. It's uh, a disaster because it uh, um, caused a lot of dry proof contributions. That is, people that uh, come, in, uh, come in once, do a, a perform a change, and, uh, and uh, disappear. Uh, the problem is that it means that they don't maintain the, the change of the new feature that they donated over time. It, falls back again on the core developers. And uh, believe me, we are pulling the short end of the straw because if you have read the mythical man month, you know that maintenance of code is actually more expensive than the creation of it. To sum up, we have a, a small amount of developers that do, are doing lots of work. They need the code that's easy to pick up and understand for the common maintenance and uh, support services, well-tested code, assurance uh, uh, that changes are not breaking on platform they don't own, on data sources they don't have, and uh, skip all the small checks in the pull request reviews and concentrate on the big items. And that's where automated QA shines. So the first step has been continuous integration. Uh, at the beginning, we had Jenkins, and we have had Jenkins for a lot of time. Jenkins has been building the code, assuring it compiles and passing, passing is passing test for a lot of time. And at the beginning, at the times where we were, were using SVN, it was working great. However, um, and, and yeah, it uh, builds uh, multiple platform, it cascades the build, so if you make a change in GeoTools, it also builds the Geo web cache and Geo server. It tests post GIS, GeoPack, and MySQL, and so on, and sends a notification mails on failure. Now, this is not enough in uh, 2021 open source uh, because the builds and notifications, they all happen after the merge. drive through contributor at that point are gone and you, you either have to go and chase them or fix yourself whatever issue might have happened. Uh, which means that uh, the maintainer, which has also a job and a family, has to stop whatever was doing to pay attention to somebody else's work uh, because it's breaking the build and you cannot have a, a broken build. So enter GitHub uh, pull request checks. They run on the changes of the pull request and maintainer won't merge uh, the pull request until all the builds pass. It's a great point to run as many checks as possible to make sure that there are no surprises. So we do that. We build on different operating systems to you know, reestablish uh, this uh, support for multiple operating systems in a stronger way. We test on different Java versions. We uh, do integration tests over various data sources. You can see SQL Server, uh, MySQL, Oracle, PostGIS, GeoPackage, and so on. So, uh, and we also do Q automatic QA tests. So this helps a lot. When all this battery of tests is green, there's a very good chance that ch the, the, the change is not introducing anything bad. However, 
there is still the pull, the pull request review to do once you have everything green. And there can be lots of noise. And this picture is kind of uh, a, a metaphor of what you might see when looking at a pull request. Uh, there might be lots of, as, or lots of many issues that might be hiding a big issue. I'm telling you that there is a big problem in this, uh, in this image, but uh, it's very difficult to see. At the very least, I don't see it. Maybe you are better than me. So uh, what is the problem? Well, uh, for once, the, uh, the typical pull request uh, review UI goes straight into details. So it sets you and your mind into analytical and detail-oriented review because you see changes line by line. And you are very much affected with anything that changes the lines of code. And it gets harder to see the bigger picture. Uh, the number one killer is code formatting issues. Uh, uh, people reformatting code uh, in, during pull request to suit their uh, preferences or just the automatic set settings of their IDE, it changes so much uh, code that it's really difficult to find out what actually changed the substantial changes. And this is both frustrating and time consuming. We kept on telling people, please do not reformat, please do not reformat. It didn't help. So in the end, we adopted an automated code formatter that has one valid formatting. There is only one way the Java files we handle can be formatted. Everything else is flagged as an error. We use it for both Java and for the uh, Maven build files. Now, why is this good? Um, there is a code formatter for Python called black that gives a very good uh, argument about why it's good to have only one way to express the, the code. Um, you have a speed and determinism. You will uh, save men time and mental energy for more important matters, the ones that are not about uh, uh, look, uh, placing the code in, in the right uh, way. Black and code looks the same regardless of the project you're reading. So uniformity, which means it's great for sharing code. You, we don't have personal styles spread across different modules, which again is important for um, all these support contracts where you have to go and look into code that somebody else has had to uh, uh, add write. But uh, more importantly, it makes code reviewed faster by producing the smallest possible diffs. When you have only one way to format the files, the only lines that are changed only are the ones that are that have substantial changes and not cosmetic ones. So you can focus on what matters. Another uh, very nasty source of uh, noise is dead code. People, developers, they write code uh, maybe with distractions, maybe under pressure. Uh, for a variety of reasons, they go back and forth and they leave in the code commented out sections, unused variables, unused methods, unreachable code. And when the reviewer looks at them, he, tries to un uh, he or she tries to understand what they do. And newsflash, they don't do anything. They are just uh, extra cognitive load for the review today and for the understanding of the code tomorrow. But tools can find them and flag them for you. Also, when you get a pull request that has a substantial number of dead code, typically it means that the, the something went wrong during the development and there was a lot of back and forth. Maybe the developer was in over his head, maybe he was rushed, maybe he was distracted. Whatever the reason, it typically implies that there is other issues that in, in the pull request and extra attention has to be paid during the review. Uh, other noise is all the little obvious bugs that there can be that uh, you have to concentrate to, to verify uh, whether or not it's a division by zero is even possible or not when tools can do uh, these verifications for you. Null pointers and closed resources, improper synchronization, and so on. There are tools dedicated to do exactly that. Uh, why waste a reviewer time when a machine can do it for you? So we use a, a number of tools, including error-prone, spot bugs, and PMD. Uh, they all take different approaches at uh, validating the code, and they tend to find different problems in the code. 
all this is enforced by automatic pull request checks and we got uh, failures and uh, an error message telling, telling us, oh, look, that method is not used. Oh, look, this uh, double checked locking is, uh, is not properly implemented. Oh, look, there, there's a potential for a division by zero and so on. And they can also be run locally. So if you wanted to uh, run them before submitting a pull request, you can. Although personally, I never do that. After a while, after keep on getting the same suggestions over and over, you learn and uh, you don't end up doing the same mistakes anymore. So it's also a teaching um, experience. Now, let's say that I added all the automatic QA to, to that pull request and I started by eliminating the common bugs. And they, then I eliminated the dead code. And then I eliminated the changes due to reformatting. And oh, a bear appears. What's the bear? The bear is that synch synchronization issue that can cause a deadlock, that recursion that goes in Stack Overflow, that runaway data structure that makes the program go out of memory, that big issue that a human is best suited to catch if they only can focus their attention on it. But they can if you remove from the table all the, the little things, all the details, all the noise that an automatic QA tool is designed exactly to review. So the level of the review has gone up by applying automatic QA tools. Now, there's a catch. It's very easy to start with an empty project and uh, a battery of these tools and just uh, apply them from day one and you are always uh, in a good shape. What if you have a 20 years old project and you want to apply these tools? <sighs> that can be really painful. It took me like uh, uh, the good part of a couple of years to apply all these tools to the projects because every time I apply one of them, uh, I have to make sure every check passes. So I basically have to fix the whole code base, which is millions of lines of code. So we did it little by little. The first step was reformatting the code base. We had months of discussions about which tools to use, how to configure it, blah, blah, blah. And once we um, agreed, uh, reformatting was a matter of uh, calling a, um, a command and then uh, setting it up automated in, uh, in the pull request checks. Um, then we had an organically growing set of uh, pull request checks. Uh, uh, adding more coverage for more OSs, more Java versions, more integration tests for databases. And I would like to thank both Brad and Bart, which have been both maintaining and adding uh, the, um, the automated builds for the pull request checks. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, we have been doing all the work needed to make the checks pass whenever we were adding one. Uh, in terms of static analysis, we started. I started with error prone and, uh, and spot bugs. Uh, did a full sweep of the code base. Thankfully, these tools did not find that many changes. It only took a few months per tool <laughs> to uh, to to uh, clean up the code base. A few months, uh, solar time. Uh, I was working only in the weekends, a few hours per weekend. And then we started adding uh, also PMD. PMD, thankfully, it, it does a lot of checks, but thankfully it's configurable. So I basically started adding uh, uh, checks one by one and fixing them and then, uh, you know, uh, adding them in pull request checks and then start over with another uh, verification, start over and so on and so on. And, and after, well, well over a year, uh, I got to the point where we are. Since the tools are useful and uh, uh, they can also catch uh, modern uh, programming patterns and so on and usage of all uh, of old APIs and so on, we started doing uh, also that and uh, set up a, a PMD so that it catches usage of old uh, Java API, usage of old uh, Java uh, syntax and, uh, and so on so that uh, Mm, we cannot use it anymore in the code base. And that also made it at the same time more modern, but at the same time also more uniform. And thankfully tools like IntelliJ can perform uh, automatically most of these uh, uh, refactorings on the entire code base for you. So it wasn't like uh, uh, with the PMD checks where I had to do everything by hand. Final thoughts. Uh, having these tools and having the code base compliant with these tools gave us 
common formatting, no dead code, no trivial bugs. So when you jump in on uh, a bit of code that you haven't never seen, uh, understanding gets easier, fixing, fixing issues gets easier, and uh, developing new feature gets easier. Uh, because it's easier to get started from a cleaner base. This is something that I actually found out by myself a few years ago when trying to contribute to QGIS. They already had automatic formatting and a few other checks. And uh, the first impression that I had when I, uh, when I was coding in C++ was, whoa, the code is so clean, right? And uh, um, it actually, on one side, made me uh, want to preserve that cleanness. And on the other side, it was uh, just easier to understand. Um, all these tools are actually uh, helpers if you try to leverage them, because it means that you don't need to, to run uh, uh, virtual machines to test code on uh, other operating system or run locally all the integration tests and so on. You can just do your code change the best way you can. Uh, you can throw the thing at GitHub and uh, the, all the integration tests will, uh, will check and, uh, and find problems for you. So the attitude should be, these are the tools that are making me, uh, helping me to, to provide better results and not uh, cops that are there to catch me. The social effect in general is good. Uh, you know, maybe some of you have heard of the broken window theory, which can be applied to software as well. So when you reach onto a code base and you start making changes, you get a feeler about how it's structured, uh, how well, uh, how clean it is, how well it's working, and you basically try to adapt to that level. So if you start seeing broken windows, you don't mind breaking a few others because you know there are so many which are already broken. So neglected code begets more neglected code. Instead, clean code brings people to, uh, uh, well, contribute quality code. There is also a short social effect on reviews um, because the QA tools being automated, uh, they are fair. This, they give the same treatment to everyone. I'm receiving, when I do a pull request, from this tool exactly the same treatment as the random contributor receives. So we can't say that, oh, the maintainer is being picky and nasty with me. Those checks are uniform for everyone. And we also limit the frustrating ping pong between the review and, and contributor. Back when we didn't have these tools, uh, you do a first, first pull request and you cannot see the changes because there are, there are two formatting changes. You ask them to be removed. Okay, now you see the changes and you start noticing dead code and you start noticing obvious bugs and you ask for changes. And, uh, uh, and then when those are gone, when maybe you start stepping back and concentrating on the bigger picture and you find bigger problems and the, the the contributor says, well, damn it, it's the third time you, you review this poor request. Are you mad at me or something? No, no, I'm not. It's just that I'm going through steps in trying to figure out where the problems are. However, uh, this is not all uh, roses uh, because there is part peculiar or particular developers uh, trying to contribute and they say, oh no, I can't live with this formatting or I can't work with the, without the library or I don't care about these checks. The fact is when a pro project is large as GeoTools and GeoServer are, they are group, group effort and we cannot afford to have everyone push their favorite direction. We need to uh, compromise. Uh, just to give you an idea, it's not that I particularly like the, the Google Java format output. In some cases, it's actually ugly, and I have to adjust the code, maybe split it into more methods and uh, add more support variables to make it more readable once it's formatted. So I'm not in love with it, but it's the same formatting for everybody. Um, others come in and say, oh, what about all these uh, this, um, checks? It's too hard to to contribute, I don't care about PND, I don't care about writing tests, I don't care about having to run Maven on my local machine. Uh, however, you found code that was cleaner because of all these tests and, and all these checks, and now it's your turn to keep it that way. It helps to have a, a clear checklist on the pull request where you communicate clearly what is needed for a merge, and we do. And it's again, 
uh, important to be fair, this checklist has to be applied to the core developer and the casual contributor the same way. Everyone has to respect it as is. And if you really find someone that is getting mad at you uh, because of the rules of contribution, because uh, of the review, don't worry. Just install a stale bot and leave the, the pull request there, waiting for the contributor to uh, decide that they really want the change to be merged. And if that doesn't happen, the stale bot will close the PR for you and no more discussions. There is another uh, approach that you can take, and this is the last uh, slide, get maintenance funding. If uh, uh, most of the problem that we have here is that we don't have enough developers and we don't have enough developer time dedicated to uh, maintenance and uh, uh, pull request management review and, and so on. If you can find a way to um, uh, allocate some money uh, to, to that activity, then you can hire people to do it during the, their working hours, which is something that has just happened with GDAL. And that also adds a human touch to the whole process. Because I, I agree the the automatic QA tools can be a bit dry. However, this requires your community to donate to the project. And uh, in GeoServer and GeoTools, we have the appropriate donate but buttons, but I can tell you they are not used much. And this is it. Thank you. We cannot hear you, Till. You're on mute. Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much for your talk. Really, really interesting stuff. And uh, for me, uh, really uh, interesting to see how you manage that in the in the back end. I think a lot of people have the same problems. And of course, we have some, some questions. And the first one is, when you reformatted the code, what happened to the open pull request? Did they conflict? No, the, the pull request has to be provided in a formatted state already. And if the contributor has run the Maven build at least once before uh, sending the pull request, they will get the right formatting. Uh, so when you, you, when you build with Maven, it automatically happens. The formatter runs. So at that point, you just have to submit the pull request and it's done. If you don't build, so the thing is, when I see a, a pull request which is misformatted, I already know that you didn't run that the contributor didn't run the Maven build and they didn't try to run uh, the, the test and so on, and that's bad. Okay. Uh, there's another question. I think that's an easy one. Can you give an idea about the percentage of your time you spent on GeoTools, GeoSver, GeoWebCache code review in the past and now? And Another question came up, it was, do the tools you use automatically apply formatting to code in pull request, or do you ask the contributor to format the code before As sending I said, the pull request? When you build with Maven, it happens locally. The uh, formatting happens automatically, and then when you send the pull request, it's already in, in the right formatting. Uh, we don't actually have a way to change the, the code in, uh, in the pull request uh, in a dynamic way. It has to come in in uh, already formatted. But as I said, if you build with Maven before sending a pull request, it's already formatting as it should be. So it's really easy. One just has to to build with Maven, which should be done anyways to run the integration tests. Okay. So and we have a last question. How does this approach fit into the agile development environment where uniform code approach is not necessarily present? So, <laughs> we, we have a, a, um, a specific situation for open source projects, but uh, uh, when I talk to customers and they apply Agile and Scrum and so on, they typically have a sonar running on the uh, code base and sonar flags uh, all sorts of violations, and they typically then allocate uh, every few sprints a story to reduce the code depth as reported by by Sonar. So that's how they typically do it. That said, most of the people I talk to in interviews and the customers, they also have uh, some sort of 
either formatting check with maybe check style or some automated formatting tool. Okay, thank you very much, Andrea. A lot of information for all our brains and uh, thank you very much again for your talk. And uh, yeah, we are directly on with uh, the next talk here. And luckily the presenter appeared. Hi, Matteo. Hi, Jill. How are you? you? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm happy that you're here. Yeah. And okay, uh, maybe, maybe you share your screen. Yeah, sure. Let me just.